Good evening to you tuned in to Smart 24 TV and thank you for joining us for this particular bulletin. I'm Rona Nahabwe with Winnie Wiza Nakaucho, the sign language interpretation. First, let's look at our top stories. In business today, Bank of Uganda has released its monetary policy statement for April with a central bank rate maintained at 10%. Drama prevails in Parliament as MPs disagree over 2.33 trillion shillings, pushing the issue to next week. And Ministry of Finance has proposed levying a 5% tax on all profitable digital companies in Uganda. You're welcome once again to Business Today and thank you for joining us. Now let's kick it off with Bank of Uganda's monetary policy statement. Bank of Uganda has released its monetary policy statement for April with a central bank rate maintained at 10%. According to Michael Atig Igo, the deputy governor of Bank of Uganda, there has been a decline in inflation from 9.2% to 9.0%, which is in line with the projections made earlier. Let's have a look at this report. According to Michael Artin Ego, the deputy governor of the Bank of Uganda, the economy has registered some growth as anticipated since February when the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting was held. He noted that inflation has reduced from 9.2% to 9.0%, which is in line with the projections made earlier with the economic activity influenced by the high frequency indicators and moderation in growth reflected by the tight monetary and fiscal policies. The Monetary Policy Committee, MPC, maintained the central bank rate, CBR, at 10%. The economy has broadly evolved in line with our expectations at the February 2023 MPC meeting. The March 2023 data from the Uganda Bureau of Statistics indicated that annual headline and core inflation dropped to 9% and 7.6 percent in March 2023 from 9.2 percent and 7.8 percent in February 2023 respectively. Economic growth remains on um, a recovery path averaging 6.8 percent in the first two quarters of the financial year 2022 stroke 23 and this was supported by a stronger recovery in services and agricultural output. However, the quarterly economic growth for quarter two of financial year 22-23 dropped to 4.4% from the 9.2% uh, recorded in the first quarter of financial year 2022-23 stroke 23, due to a decline in industrial output and a moderation in the services output growth. The economy is still facing challenges, such as a heavy debt burden, which is leading to a contradiction between fiscal operations and budget projections. This has resulted into financial instability, a decrease in the external financial gap, high interest rates that affect the cost of living. The fiscal deficit is much lower than what had been projected before. I think uh, uh, the, the difference between what had been projected and what came out is around 1. Point, uh, something, 1.5 trillion or so. Now, and that is in spite of uh, the increase in uh, uh, debt servicing. You are absolutely right, yes, there was high interest payment because yields rose, the yields on government securities rose, and therefore requiring more money to service the debt. But overall, uh, what the government did in the under fiscal consolidation is that it had to cut some other expenses and then pay obviously the interest uh, component. The banking sector is not only well capitalized but also manifests substantial liquidity, making it capable of absorbing any potential interest rate shocks and continuing to provide credit to the economy. The strength of the banking sector is likely to boost the overall resilience of the economy. There is no bank that holds more than 25% of its assets in government securities. So even uh, an, an, a proposed increase in interest rates would not cause a shock to significantly erode their liquidity or their capital. So 
from that from in terms of their resilience to interest rate shocks, the banks in Uganda, all without exception, are actually resilient to that. Now, if the, the issues that happen with the global banks, would that impact, impact the banking sector in Uganda? Not entirely. Um, we have, uh, there was initial scare, but right now, if you even look at the, 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 the share prices for some of these banks that were having a bit of a hiccup, to use your words, have, they, they've restored back their, their share prices. The Monetary Policy Committee projects economic growth in the 5.5 to 6.0 percent range for the financial year 2022-2023. The shilling is also expected to face pressure due to the increased external financing requirements. This combined with the lower export to import prices and the slower export volume growth is predicted to result in a current account deficit of 7.4 percent of the GDP over the next three years, which will hinder economic growth. Martha Nimsima, Smart 24 TV, Business Today. Now, away from that report, let's look at chaos in Parliament as the 2023-2024 budget is rejected. Parliament has become dramatic as lawmakers reject the 2.33 trillion shillings supplemental budget that the administration had hoped to pass today. As legislators became unruly, Thomas Taeba, the deputy speaker, was compelled to adjourn the session until things were under control. The 2.33 trillion shilling supplementary budget was initially turned down by various parliamentary committees on grounds that some of the government's top priorities did not live up to expectations, while other more urgent concerns still needed to be addressed. The proposal to adopt the aforementioned additional budget was brought by government to parliament yesterday, but it was delayed until today due to resistance from lawmakers. <laughs> Just like yesterday, MPs continue to criticize the executive for prioritizing projects such as the Achak Sugar Factory, Munyonyo Convention Center, Lubawa Specialized Hospital, Abubakar Construction Farm, and Kira Motors. The farms were granted money without the House's approval, which increased tension in the House. Those of you who are not here, Munyonyo consumed a lot of money, chogam money. To date, if you asked me, for all these years I've been here, how much money we have there, I wouldn't tell you. There are no books. We are not allowed even to look, to even see. Not even auditing. And a lot of money. Part of that, Munyonyo, supposedly belongs to you and me and other Ugandans. Is that what it is today? We have a problem in Uganda. Even the committees that are, are supposed to, to, to supervise, like trade, Sometimes we are frustrated. We made the reports not to appropriate money to attack. But money was channeled and it is through even these, these ministers. So right, Honorable Speaker, I don't see any reasons much as money is going to UDC. Money, we've been appropriating money to go to this, the, the banana, something which comes from my district. And if it would be profitable, I would be saying we give money. But right, Honorable Speaker, I don't know if we are planning for this country that there is tomorrow, we have another generation to come, or we are eating as if we are dying tomorrow or today. After assisting the atmosphere in the room, the Deputy Speaker asked Honorable Mwanga Chivumbi to present a proposal to amend Section 25 of the Public Finance Management Act, which permits government to approve money without the knowledge of the legislature. This because money has already been allocated and dispersed without the consent of the legislature. You don't say we are not going to give money to this. You have already given. Money under 3% is the problem, colleagues. And I'm not up about it. Now, the problem, the money which we still have serious control is money which is not under 3%. And then we come back as a house. We address the issue. The one of Chivumbi has said it, but postmortem does not help. You are going to give money to, to Munyonyo, where even the Auditor General has deliberately refused to give books of accounts for auditing, and we are going to invest more money. 
the Speaker attempted to advance the discussion to the committee of the full House, but the members of the House rejected it and became angry, declaring that they would not accept the committee stage of the supplementary. <laughs> Speaker Taiwa was then forced to suspend House for 20 minutes for government and opposition to reach a common ground before the matter can be brought back for discussion. I have consulted leaders on both sides. We've agreed, uh, and the Dean of Independence, indeed, yes. I should join them. Yes. So uh, the leadership, yes. the leadership on both sides, and uh, Chief Whip, you know the team you want to go with, Rope, you know the team you want to go with. I'm going to give you my own loan so that you can be able uh, to meet. In 20 minutes, you should have maximum 20 minutes, we shall resume. How suspended for 20 minutes? <laughs> Smart 24 TV, business today. Chaos in Parliament, legislators on the ICT committee have expressed their disappointment with the media legislators over what they called malicious programs aimed at destroying reputations of certain individuals with the, regula with the regulators doing nothing about it. This happened during the presentation of the policy statements of the entities under the ICT ministry. In the interest of time members, I want us to proceed. Today, ministerial statements were presented by organizations that included Media Center, Media Council and the New Vision, along with their mother ministry, the ICT Ministry and National Guidance. The committee has praised the organizations for their successful performance for this fiscal year, but has warned government about UBC's ongoing poor performance. How come you people are able to make a profit and UBC is not able to make a profit? What are you doing differently? Because we were discussing that from the New Vision side, I mean from the UBC side, they gave us. But here you are reporting profits and you're a media house, you're a government, largely government-owned business. So what are you doing differently that probably UBC is not doing? Maybe there are some benchmarking lessons that can be made. Legislators have also taken a firm stance against some media outlets who have made it a point to maliciously attack people, particularly politicians, while regulatory agencies like the Media Council stand by and do nothing. And somebody goes on air and says, not even by anything, says, Magogomubi. And he's an employee of UBC. And not once, not twice, actually not one year, not two years, but over five years, continually. And the... It continues. So there is a, a real problem. It's not just a question, but a real, real problem. That is the level of impunity. These editors seem not to be regulated. What is being aired sometimes has a lot of malicious propaganda. It is this committee to ensure that one is handled. Let somebody release information on the local FM, which is real. So I just imagine, Chair, there is a gap. The committee has also advised government to find a solution to the issue of rent because most of its entities are accumulating debt because of rent. Uh, harmonize with the Media Center and Media Council. Uh, he's talking about the rent where he stays. Uh, it might be if that is a building that belongs to you, UCC, right? So if he has issues with the rent, why don't you deal with it for actually both media center is also suffering from rent the other side. Why don't you have both in your building and actually just do book entries, uh, you know, government pays government. It makes it easier. In response, the Minister for ICT recognized the shortcomings in enforcing regulations governing the media, but he still works to bring certain irresponsible media figures to justice. To avoid paying large rent areas, the minister claims that government is going to build a government campus at Weabaja where all the entities will be housed. Sometimes, especially like the radios, they can come and just finish you off as a member of parliament or any other person. So we concede we have gaps. Like he said, the staffing is inadequate. 
and the media council works with UCC to handle that. As the day goes on, the committee continue to meet different entities as they present their ministerial statements for accountability and accuracy. Samlanifa, Smart 24 TV, Business Today. More from business today, government has proposed a 5% tax on foreign digital companies. The government's long-awaited threat to tax foreign digital companies may soon come to uh, true, following a suggestion by the Ministry of Finance to levy a 5% tax on all digital enterprises that get income from Uganda. Experts have called it double taxation and that the government is putting these companies at a risk of withdrawing their digital services in the country. Pedersen Mumbere reports. We apologize for that mishap and let's move on with business today. Now, looking at manipulating digital tax stamps, proposals before Parliament suggest that any person who manipulates digital tax stamps commits an offence and attracts a fine of 30 million shillings or imprisonment. According to URA Commissioner General John Musinguzi, this is meant to enforce co compliance and track down fraud, although manufacturers, on the other hand, demand for harmonization of levies. Driving business. Don't miss on Smart 24 TV. Do you find yourself postponing and postponing? You want to start that business. Year one, year two, year three, you're still making plans. Please join us as we get to talk to Ruth. We'll be talking about how to start, why you aren't starting, and how to get the wheel to start. You'll be surprised about what you can learn. So join us this Saturday at 8 p.m. Women in Business on Smart.
ड्राइविंग बिजनेस The Minister of Finance has proposed levying a 5% tax on all profitable digital companies in Uganda. Concerned experts have responded to this plan by calling it double taxation and saying that government is putting these corporations at a risk of seizing their digital services in the nation despite the fact that Uganda needs them more than they do. Should this tax be imposed? We're looking at so many hindrances where we are right now. Right now, 80% Well, Mr. Bob, seventy percent of us are using Android. Android is a Google product. If you impose this tax, what will happen? We're already having the challenge with smart penetration. The price of a smartphone is very high. If you impose this tax, what will happen to the price of a smartphone? It will go up tremendously. So it is going to affect us more than it will affect. So sometimes when the government goes into implementing these taxes, you have to look at who is losing more and who is going to gain more. When you go to buy uh, these subscriptions, um, you already pay taxes. So they are paying taxes in their jurisdiction. For me, who is earning as a local Ugandan uh, from these services, I also have to pay taxes. So it's going to be double taxation on both sides. The government is proposing to add a new clause to section 86A of the Principal Act and impose a tax on non-residents who provide digital services in the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2023. Chris Bariyomosi, the Minister of Information, Communication, Technology and National Guidance says that government is widening its tax collection base. Therefore, it's prudent for these foreign companies to pay tax. Companies like Twitter, like Facebook, and the other platforms and i know in the other countries they pay taxes so there's nothing wrong because the government is trying to widen the tax base and the, if local companies here pay taxes so why wouldn't the foreign based company pay also taxes because if all of us are using twitter if all of us are using facebook or instagram then those companies are benefiting and therefore making a contribution to the tax base of this country i think it's not it's not wrong so we shall discuss this proposal and i think it is good for us as a country they do get money that is okay but do we have an alternative do you have something that can combat growth where we are do you have a system that can can level up with oracle that is ugandan is african at the moment According to information in the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2023, digital companies that receive income from providing digital services to a Ugandan customer over the internet and electronic network or online platform are subjected to this tax. As much as this suggestion will be discussed, Kevin Wava, the managing director of Sunbelt Holdings and a finance expert, urged the government to adopt a comprehensive approach because in the alternative it may end up losing. We need to do a very good deep dive and categorize what this imposed non-resident tax that the government is imposing. So we look at it in a holistic approach. And what categories do we want to look at first? We can say high, medium, and low, and then we come up with benchmarks against which we can feel is equitable, and government can feel comfortable. Yes, this. Uh, should be you're in Uganda, you're doing this, and this is medium to low risk, but this one, the impact is negligible. This one's can be weighed for certain reasons. But if you blanket it, then that means uh, it's, it's blur. It's not very clear. In 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Council released a non-binding resolution noting that the internet is a catalyst for the enjoyment of human rights, most notably the right to freedom of expression and condemned international disruptions of the internet access by governments, further reaffirming that the same rights people have offline must also be projected online. However, 
The president of Uganda has frequently expressed his contempt for social media sites while urging that they should be taxed in order to stop public chatter and generate cash for the government. Bedson Mumbere Smart, 24 TV, Business Today. Let's now look at manipulating digital stamps. Now, proposal before Parliament suggests that any person who manipulates digital tax stamps commits an offence that attracts a fine of 30 million shillings or imprisonment. According to URA's, URA's Commissioner General John Musinguzi, this is meant to enforce compliance and track down fraud, although manufacturers, on the other hand, demand for harmonization of levies. Let's have a look. The proposal seeks to amend the Tax Procedures Code Act 2014, as well as establish penalties for anyone found to have fixed or activated digital stamps on the wrong goods, brands, or volume other than the gazetted for the purpose. In 2019, government introduced digital stamps in efforts that sought to streamline the agenda to a robust tax base for a number of goods, among which included mineral water, beer, spirits, wine, soda, and cigarettes amid its resistance. Lately, Uganda Revenue Authority informed that the new proposed policy is meant to fast track fraud and the level of compliance. Digital tracking solution, the one that issues those digital stamps, is primarily meant to ensure that uh, those items that pay uh, the excise duty are, are all of them pay. So this, this technology of stamps is really to ensure that the t items that are supposed to pay uh, excise duty on them have actually paid. Now, there is an element by some people who are not very compliant to try and tamper with the equipment that stamps those products. And uh, that law will address that risk. Anybody who tampers with an installation that has been made to track the compliance in that area will be punished. And uh, it is just to step up the level of compliance. PSFU previously released reports proposing that the exemption of payment for digital tax stamps for local products in order to widen the tax base is imperative for the local industry to compete favorably with its East African community partners. The things that you are competing on are efficiencies on the cost of the goods. Now, if the, the price you pay for a digital stamp, which is now becoming a cost of production, is much higher in Uganda than in another country. It means the other product from the other country is going to be cheaper than yours, so yours will be higher. Now, look at a consumer. Who is going to consume to buy these goods? He reaches the supermarket or the store. There is a product eh, made in country, whatever, and there is a product made in Uganda. The one from Uganda has a higher price than the other one. Now, what would you expect them to choose? So this is the reason we really would like and we propose that the, the stamps, the cost of stamps should be at the same rate or lower than the other countries that are, are charging. In a phone call interview with a local manufacturer, Banange Brewing Company, we have learned that the biggest challenge has been the separate payment of excise duty and digital tax stamps, which is costly. I think we pay like 1.2 million for a roll of 30,000 stickers. The purpose of the stamps are to show that people are paying excise tax and that the products are not counterfeit. Yeah, like for us where we're paying the tax anyways, like it is, my, my only complaint would be that they make you pay for the stamp in addition to, to the excise tax. I would certainly support the government in their efforts to improve tax collection. It is worth noting that the government introduced digital tax stamps on goods that attract excise duty to prevent underdeclaration and misclassification by manufacturers. With the proposed stringent penalties for abuse of regulations, there is still fear of survival and lockout of most companies. Deal with, with fraud. It's deal with somebody who goes out of his way to, to lie about you know, the, the collection or the, or the equipment that has been set to monitor. Runana Habwe, Smart24TV, Business Today.
Youth participation in expansion and development of businesses is, is a contentious issue in society. This initiative, which was launched in Barara City, aims to train and educate young entrepreneurs on how to grow and sustain their enterprises as part of efforts to reduce the nation's current unemployment rate. Now, Catherine Namugera has details to this report. Smart twenty four driving business. of Uganda in a new international park. It must be rich, tall, handsome, from a respectable family. He must have a maid because at our home we do not work. Eh, conduct some Hey, what? Over door of your simu? Yamunang, anti your TV and cholera. Your TV and cholera. You good you did, and you saw. Oh, we have to get TV so come to Nana. Naja radio, a hotel, then is a film. More scenes, it is our no worry. Get up app store or take up your TV channels. Cosimo, or you will not go to the world. It will tell you cause the sad data. Your TV channels. And this of Gavi. Dungaza Imutian Freedom Bandos is a teen of Como. Nigasta, Emwe Zero Zero Star, Ivy Emwe Hash. Ninga my Emutian up, I have got bandos in Yamwinji. Twen Hamwe, Tinich Turema. Luxury redefined at Seasan Hotel as you indulge in the splendor of elegant living, feed for the royalty that you are. Step into comfort, pampering and blissful customer-centric service as you select from our range of comfy exquisite living quarters furnished to meet with your royal preference. Surrounded by scenic beauty, our tropical setting allows you to escape the clamorous ordeal of city life. Our ambient green gardens will guide you to a place of revitalizing rest. The three-star restaurant caters to your palate, serving your choice menu ranging from exotic cuisines to local delicacies. Our chefs will serve you full course meals for a truly out-of-this-world culinary experience. Our fully stocked bar to wet your throat from renowned global brand whisks, brandies, jeans, beers and wines to our locally celebrated beverages, you will not lack for any brewage. It's an all-new experience in the East at Seasun Hotel. So visit today at Plot 15 to 19 Spire Road Ginger or contact us on plus 256-751-719-960 and plus 256-785-354-614 for reservations. Seasun Hotels, luxury redefined. Driving business.
We'll be back from that short commercial break and thank you for sticking with us. Now, moving on with business today, youth participation in the expansion and development of businesses is a contentious issue in society. The initiative which was launched in Barara City aims to train and educate young entrepreneurs on how to grow and sustain their enterprises as part of the efforts to reduce the nation's current unemployment rate. Now, Catherine Namurera has details of this report. The quality of products you are having so are those issues recorded anywhere in your business? Young entrepreneurs frequently try to launch small farms in order to better themselves, but many of them do not survive to celebrate the first anniversary due to the difficulties they encounter due to lack of business management skills. The Start and Enhance Your Company program was created by the international organization in collaboration with the Agency of Education Systems Improvement to assist young entrepreneurs in Barra City by providing them with training in business management and promotion. To the embrace in our lives as long as we are doing business. Let's not just look at it as a topic, but something we can roll out. The training was led by master trainers Okelo Fred Okot and Tushabe Simon Abias, who gave youth technical support and bridge existing business margins during the training. The training is going to benefit the young entrepreneurs. One, we all know the margin of employment in our society. We all know the gaps that the youth are facing. Youth apparently know, I'm going to look for jobs, I'm looking for this job, but their mindset is fixed. They don't know that I need to get out of that mindset. I need to go look for an opportunity. I need to create an opportunity. So with the SIYB program, we have broad knowledge. We have broad ideas to share with the youth that helps them believe in themselves, understand themselves, and get motivated to open up opportunities for themselves, to create jobs for themselves, and this is what we intend to do as SIYB. One of the instructors, Kabanza David, supported this training program in Barra as one of the steps to improve youth employment options. So, particularly now, we organized a training which attracted 15 enterprises. These enterprises are already in existence, but wanted to build capacity to improve their profitability so that they can employ more youth, so that they can get more profits and, and the, 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 the companies themselves grow bigger. So we are training these entrepreneurs to build capacity uh, in the, the concept of business analysis, business planning and business growth. Um, those are the areas that we are addressing in this workshop. Nambara youngsters who attended the program expressed their appreciation for the project since it will aid in their development, despite the fact that they have faced considerable difficulties in sustaining and promoting their business. Uh, the challenges we usually face in our business is identifying those internal processes and challenges. You find often times our business you cannot easily identify what are your products or how are you going to market them, you don't know the channels to use to market, but then this time it actually helped us to identify properly what are you uh, what our products definitely and then so how to market them how to sell them and then do a bit of analysis on understand that this child this is not going to work in our business this product will not work and then leave it then after go to another product line that is going to actually work for our business in this training program that is done by ILO of your business I've mainly learned how to do business analysis where you get to identify how your business is doing, how it was performing previously, and then improving on why it's not performing. Okay, let ask the youth to leave their comfort zones and think beyond their development. To the youth out there, it is honestly true that the economy has margins when it comes to employment. We know thousands and thousands and thousands are looking for opportunity. But I want to encourage you, I want to motivate you, I want to let you know that if you open up an opportunity for yourself, if you create a job for yourself, eventually you're going to have what to do, you're going to help your friends, you're going to help your relatives, and you're going to reach out to thousands of youth out there. But if we continue with a fixed mindset of, I'm waiting for a job, then eventually we are not going to grow as youth, we are not going to grow as an economy. Catherine Amgerwa compile this story. Away from empowerment of the youth in Barara City, let's look at climate financing. Now, just yesterday, 
the Uganda Development Bank launched a 50 trillion shillings climate finance facility. This is just part of the efforts for the national resilience to climate change. Tonight we are joined by UDB's chief economist, Dr. Francis Mwesije, to understand how the Green Investment Initiative intends to pan out. Thank you. Good evening, uh, good evening. Good evening, good evening uh, doctor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, dear viewers. All right. Now, as, as development, as a development finance institution, where does climate finance work? Because we have, we have learned or we know that you guys are poised your efforts towards agriculture and industry. Where does climate finance rank? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe uh, before I even got this question, uh, I could briefly introduce Uganda Development Bank to those who might not have, uh, who might not interfaced with us uh, before. Uh, Uganda Development Bank is the country's national development finance institution, uh, call it uh, DFI, uh, that is mandated to accelerate social economic development in Uganda through sustainable financial intervention. And consistent with uh, this uh, specific mandate, uh, the bank supports uh, the private sector, uh, businesses or investments in the private sector that seek to improve uh, production, uh, output, tax contribution, foreign exchange earnings, uh, and definitely create uh, jobs for Ugandans. Uh, the bank supports a number of, a number of, uh, of sectors and subsectors. Uh, to achieve or, uh, this mandate. Uh, and among the sectors that the bank supports, in, uh, they include uh, primary agriculture, uh, industry, uh, under which we have manufacturing and agro-processing. Uh, we have inf uh, infrastructure, we have tourism, uh, we have human capital, uh, under which also we have uh, health and education. But education, we mainly, or the bank mainly supports uh, skilling. So you, you asked a question uh, about where climate change uh, comes in. Uh, climate change, uh, one cannot be disentangled uh, from the economy. Uh, as you might know uh, that last year alone, we had this prolonged drought uh, that resulted into food insecurity in some parts of our country. For example, you might remember the food insecurity Moja uh, and many uh, other related uh, skirmishes of insecurity across the country. Uh, as a result of that, we saw our inflation rise. Yes, there was uh, an effect of uh, the geopolitical tensions, the Ukraine war, the aftermath of COVID, uh, which all uh, together led to the rise in inflation. But if you really zoomed in into that inflation, you realize that food inflation was one of the key drivers, uh, apart from fuel, uh, that was mainly uh, driven by the geopolitical maybe, tensions. Maybe to so climate change right is, there. yes. Maybe to yes. interject you right there, how does the 50 billion climate fund relate with the 268 billion that was allocated for in, the, in this financial year in, in order to mitigate and ad adaptation of climate change measures? How does it relate with the budget? Uh, which budget, uh, if you could speak to the budget, because the 50 billion, uh, let me speak to the climate, I was providing the background to climate change, uh, but yesterday the bank launched uh, what we call a climate finance facility, uh, and when we are launching uh, in the first year, bank put in 50 billion. Uh, the climate finance facility that we are launching yesterday is something that we see as a vehicle uh, for mobilizing capital as a vehicle for providing capital, uh, but also as a platform or vehicle through which we could uh, arrange or structure uh, transaction or structure projects that can benefit from this green financing. So as a seed from the bank, we put in 50 billion. There is more to come definitely because that was at the launch yesterday. More is to be put in this uh, facility. So we are really looking at much more uh, money in this facility, uh, bigger than the 50 uh, million. But maybe you're speaking uh, to the projects that we approved, the green projects that we approved last year, uh, which are worth uh, about 117 billion Uganda shillings. 
and, and, and basically what we did and what we demonstrated because there were questions of are Ugandans uh, willing to invest in uh, green related projects uh, but maybe uh, this could be caused by our, our understanding of what uh, green projects or green investment uh, means and green investment for us uh, it means any investment uh, across different sectors that we do support for example climate smart agriculture which we would evolve for example irrigation and use of water for production because that is a mitigation practice from the climate finance or from uh, uh, from the environment or climate point of view uh, organic agriculture is a green investment conservation farming is a green investment integrated pest control and precision farming is uh, a green investment if you look from the energy or infrastructure are these, are these projects are part of these the targeted initiatives of this of the fund or how are you, how, how have you ensured decentralization of these initiatives at district level and national level yeah, the, the projects that we do cover, uh, like I started, we support about six subsectors, uh, of which we have primary agriculture. So climate smart agriculture uh, is one of the areas we are looking at. So any project that comes through that line is eligible, if we could, if I can use that language. Uh, and you're asking on how we are planning to cascade this, I think, to the lowest level in the country. We have a number of uh, mechanisms in place. Uh, I'll give again an example. Uh, about two weeks ago, actually it's one week back, we launched uh, a FinTech solution. We call it uh, uh, AgriConnect. Uh, it's a, an agri, uh, we are using technology to deliver financing uh, to smallholder farmers that are organized in small groups uh, through their VSLS or village savings and loan associations. Uh, oh. So there are mechanisms in place to take Yes, please. How hard has it been for you to come up with this financing? Because we know majority of this financing comes from international mechanisms. How hard has it been for you, DB? Uh, like I said, we launched this facility yesterday. Uh, to be uh, really clear here, financing is there. There is a lot of money out there. There are commitments. Uh, there have been a number of these, uh, even last year. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, a COP27. COP, COP there are more of these that have been happening. There are mechanisms, there are funds out there that as a country we have not been able to tap into because, again, we have not been prepared. And that's why we launched this facility. Uh, this pool, uh, I call it a facility, but it's a pool of funds. So we put it to attract this funding that is always out of the country that we never get to access to, uh, to access. Uh, and now we have a vehicle or this pool that can help it. Can, so there is funding. Uh, we cannot say there is no money. And the money we put in was not uh, sourced from anywhere. This came from UDB as a bank. Uh, and, and when I was introducing, uh, I indicated that UDB is a government financial institution. It's capitalized by the government. Uh, and it came from that part of the money that we use, uh, our usual lending. It's an allocation that we put in uh, to target mainly uh, climate-related interventions. Francis, but going forward, um, we are looking at tapping into... Francis, according to Accord, the, this fund is simply not enough. Do you feel the same? Definitely. I, I, th I think I've really... What we put is a seed. This is not enough. I gave a scenario... Uh, that we put in 50 billion, but last year alone as a bank, we approved projects worth 115 billion. That's more than double the money that is in this facility. So what does that mean? That this money is not the only money there is in the facility. It was a seed we put in to launch the facility. As we speak now, we have started the engagements to bring in more money. So if we look only at 50 billion, it's not enough. Uh, what but have you looked at in regards to stakeholder engagement, Francis? Have you incorporated some of the private sector entities in regards to, you know, mitigating and adapting to the measures of climate change? Stakeholder engagements, we have uh, a number of programs, the bank uh, and platforms. Uh, one, of course, there are different stakeholders. There are funders, those who give us money, those are stakeholders. 
their beneficiaries are those who receive uh, or those that we do support or who benefit from our products, uh, for example, loans. Uh, and if we blend these loans and grants, there are those who benefit from it. So, but we do not only provide financial interventions. So we engage with our stakeholders through also our other uh, non-financial interventions. Uh, for example, we have what we call regional clinics that uh, every year uh, we get out there, uh, not once, not twice, but several times in different parts of the country and engage with the beneficiaries of our uh, financing. Uh, for example, we have, we have held regional clinics and regional symposiums. Uh, recently, we were in Yumbe launching uh, that AgriConnect, the, the FinTech solution I just talked about. We were in Soroti, we were in Barara, uh, we were in Gulu, Francis. we were in West Nile, and these are platforms through which we engage uh, these stakeholders. As we conclude, Francis, I would like your personal opinion as an expert in impact evaluation. What do you think could be the consequences of Uganda's inability to adapt to climate change? Your personal opinion, of course, as an expert in this field, what do you think could be the consequences of Uganda's inaction to adapt to climate change? Definitely, inaction uh, is disastrous uh, to, to us, and we have already seen this and we cannot afford to, uh, to not act. Because uh, when I was introducing, I talked of the drought that we saw. Uh, the locusts that invaded us in 2019 were a result of climate change. There are many others, the floods, for example, that we saw. Uh, if you remember in Bade, there is an industrial park that was uh, swallowed by water recently uh, with millions of dollars lost. That is a result of climate change. The landslides that we see are a result of climate change. So inaction has significant, significant implications to our economy uh, and all the aspects of the economy, be it social, be it environmental, and be it uh, economic. So definitely we cannot uh, afford to not act. We really have to act, and that's why as a bank, we came up with this facility. We are churning in out more money. We are coming up with business advisory, uh, pro preparing our projects to benefit from this funding. Thank you. So Thank you can. so much, Francis, for your input in business today. Thank well, that you. was Francis Mwesje, the chief economist at UDB, talking about the, their recent 50 billion fi climate finance fund. Now, moving on with business today, Argentina is now experiencing a fury of demonstrations across the country. This is due to high cost of living resulting from inflation interventions by IMF could barely salvage the situation as it is trimmed the nation's annual reserves accumulation target for 2023, $1.8 billion, hence acknowledging the impact of drought on the foreign currency flows. According to the report from the IMF, the annual reserves target of, of 9.8 billion US dollars was matched by 1.8 billion US dollars to a new target of 8 billion US dollars, a deficit that was calculated into a less favorable economic situation since the country will not be able to even service the apparent debt of 44.5 billion US dollars. Besides that, Argentina has been facing economic difficulties for years, but the situation has now worsened. The Argentinians are up in arms against a towering inflation with poverty affecting nearly half of the population. Social and political organizations blocked multiple streets and highways in into the Argentinian capital, Buenos Aires, demanding for more social aid from the government to counter the economic decline. The demonstrate is also against the adjustment policies that the IMF demands of the country, including cuts in the social spending. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, says Argentina's net reserve accumulation target for the year by 1.8 million US dollars, making a concession to the government and its warnings of the negative impact of a punishing drought on export earnings. While the net international reserves rose by 5.4 million US dollars on count of improvement in the trade balance and sizable official support, real GDP expanded by 5.4% in 2020, yet the end period annual inflation 94.8%. IMF said that Argentina's agricultural exports and foreign exchange inflows could be reduced due to the drought. This could therefore have a negative implication on growth, reserves, inflation and physical balances. This has further fueled the inflation among the public who are already struggling to make ends meet. Nearly 18.6 million people in Argentina are unable to cover their basic needs with their salaries. 
This has led to the left-leaning organization demanding an increase to sustain some peculiarly paid jobs granted to millions of unemployed people. Now that report will usher us to the close of business today. But before we do that, let's look at our top stories. In business today, Bank of Uganda has released its monetary policy statement for April, with the central bank rate maintained at 10%. Drama prevails in parliament as MPs disagree over 2.33 trillion shillings, pushing the issue to next week. And Ministry of Finance has proposed levying a 5% tax on all profitable digital companies in Uganda. And that's all we had for you on business today. As always, thank you for the pleasure of your company. If you miss any of these stories, you could catch up on our YouTube channel at Smart24 TV Live or follow us on our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. Now, I would like to wish you a happy Good Friday in advance and better Easter holidays or celebrations in advance as well. My name is Rona Nahabwe with Winnie Wien Zanaka, which you understand language. Have a good night. Driving business.